the nervous system. This is part three on our study of the nervous system and we're going to focus on the brain and the spinal cord to include reflex actions. It's really important at this stage that you know the content that was in the previous two videos, either by watching those videos or using your book. So you should be able to distinguish between the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. You should be able to draw and label good diagrams of each of the three neurons. You should be able to give an account of how the impulse is generated and transferred by the movement of those ions and you should be able to discuss in detail using really good diagrams as to how the impulse travels across a synapse and what a synapse is and finally you should be able to give an account of what Parkinson's disease is what causes it what the symptoms are and how you would treat it at the end of this video you should be able to identify key parts of the brain from a diagram you should be able to label them and state what they do just be mindful that diagrams of the brain vary greatly, so look some up on YouTube or on Google. As well as that, at the end of this video, you should be able to draw a good label diagram of the spinal cord and to outline what happens in a reflex arc. So let's start with the brain. The brain is protected by that bony structure, your skull. It's made up of billions of cells called neurons and many more other cells known as glial cells. Not on your course, but just good to know. As well as the skull, your brain is protected by these membranes called the meninges and there are three of them really important. These membranes can become inflamed, this is known as meningitis, and this inflammation can be caused by bacteria or viruses. In between each of these membranes and bathing the brain is this liquid known as cerebrospinal fluid. It's produced in the brain and it's there to protect it. It cushions the brain from impact and it helps support the brain as well. The fluid also contains glucose for nourishment, which is really important because the brain needs a lot of energy, so there'll be a lot of respiration going on. When you look at the brain, you can see that it's divided into two halves, or known as two cerebral hemispheres, and they're divided by this deep sort of crevice on the top. The left-hand side controls the right side of the body, and the right cerebral hemisphere controls the left side of the body. Now we have to look at the brain in detail and I just want to make sure you understand that this is a very simplified diagram of the brain and the one I'm going to use from now on is even further simplified, so bear that in mind. The brain is further divided into the forebrain, the hindbrain and the midbrain. The midbrain is mostly concerned with processing sound and sight and that's beyond the scope of our course. We're most concerned with the forebrain which is the cerebrum, the thalamus and the hypothalamus, the hindbrain which is the medulla oblongata and the cerebellum. The first part of the brain that we have to know about is the cerebrum. It's the largest part. We encountered it earlier on in the video because we were looking at the two cerebral hemispheres. So what is associated with the cerebrum? What does it control? Well, it controls intelligence, language, movement, sight, hearing, emotion. And a way of remembering them when you're in an exam in June is to think of cerebrum brumming along in your car off to do your driver's test or your driving test. What do you need to pass? You need to be intelligent. You need language to be able to speak to the examiner. You need to be able to move your arms and your legs. You need to be able to see, you need to be able to hear, and you need emotion to get excited when you pass. The thalamus is the sorting centre of the brain. All the incoming impulses arrive here and it passes them on to the correct part of the brain. It's just above the hypothalamus and it's a weird one to find on a diagram. It's outlined in blue here. Just beneath the thalamus is the hypothalamus outlined here in the pink and it has a role in homeostasis, maintaining constant internal conditions or environment. It basically controls things like body temperature, osmoregulation and it also produces hormones, for example that hormone ADH. The cerebellum is part of the hindbrain. It's this large structure here. It's involved in balance and in muscular coordination. So next we have the medulla oblongata outlined here in the yellow. This controls all of those involuntary actions and we encountered this in the chapter on the mechanics of breathing. So it's always worth revising that. So it also covers things like blood pressure, swallowing, sneezing, vomiting, all of those type of actions. Finally, there's the pituitary gland made up of those two lobes. Yes, it's part of the endocrine system, but it's located in the brain, so it's handy just to go over it again. It's the master gland because it makes all of those hormones, for example, growth hormone. So no harm to be revising, dipping in and out. 
Let's take a closer look at the spinal cord. It's protected by those bones in your back, the vertebrae, but they don't appear in this diagram. Bear that in mind. It's also protected by those membranes, the same membranes that protect the brain, the meninges. And in between those is that liquid cerebrospinal fluid flowing down through the centre of the spinal cord in this canal or hole, it's called the central canal, is also cerebrospinal fluid. And it has many functions. It's transporting lots of materials to and from the spinal cord as well as protecting it. In the diagram, you can see that the spinal cord is made up of white matter, which is axons only, the part of the neuron, the axon, and grey matter, which is cell bodies and dendrites. And I purposely coloured them in white and grey just to help you learn them. So when you're considering the white matter in the spinal cord, you're going to think of axons only. You're going to imagine a neuron and remember the axon. It's the long fibre leading away from the cell body and it's usually covered in that myelin sheath that's usually white, fatty. And when you consider the grey matter, you're going to consider the cell bodies and usually there are dendrites on the top of those cell bodies leading into them. It's also important that you recognise two terms. Dorsal means the back and ventral means the front. Leading into the spinal cord are the spinal nerves on either side. And just as they enter the spinal cord, they split. The back is known as the dorsal root and it's in true here that the sensory neurons will enter and carry impulses into the central nervous system, into the spinal cord. The sensory neuron enters the spinal cord through the dorsal root and we're always going to be able to recognise the dorsal root because it has a swelling called the dorsal root swelling. Inside this swelling is the dorsal root ganglion. So a ganglion is a group of cell bodies so there's going to be a collection of sensory neuron cell bodies in there. So here's a sensory neuron, you can see the cell body there. So a ganglion is a group of cell bodies so inside this dorsal root swelling will be many cell bodies of sensory neurons. So when you look to the front of the spinal cord you can see the ventral root and it's through the ventral root that the motor neurons, the axons of the motor neurons, will exit the spinal cord. A reflex action is an automatic and you must say involuntary response to a stimulus. It's a non-thinking response. Reflex actions are really important. They protect us. Can you imagine putting your hand by accident on a hot surface? You'll immediately pull it away before it gets too badly hurt. A reflex arc is the pathway taken by nerve impulses involved in a reflex action. So let's go through the reflex arc. This is a good diagram to know. If I was you, I would pause the video, draw it and put in the labels and then you'll be able to tell the story. You could be asked in your exams to draw it and label it and discuss what happens. So we're going to talk about the pin sticking in someone's skin here. So that's the stimulus, it's the pain and the pain is picked up by specialised receptor cells in the skin. This results in an electrical impulse which is carried by a sensory neuron into the spinal cord through a spinal nerve. The sensory neuron enters the spinal cord through the dorsal root. Once inside the spinal cord, the impulse is transferred to an interneuron and at the same time it's also passed to another neuron that transfers the impulse to the brain. So simultaneously at the same time, the impulse is going two places. It's going to the brain and it's also going via an interneuron towards a motor neuron. The impulse travels via a motor neuron out of the spinal cord through the ventral root down to an effector which is usually some type of muscle and it causes it to contract getting the hand or the finger out of danger. As the hand or the finger moves away the impulse reaches the brain and it becomes aware as to the pain and what happened. So that's the end of the nervous system. Know the key parts of the brain and the associated roles of each of them. Know that there are three meninges with cerebrospinal fluid and know that cerebrospinal fluid has a protective role and it's also carrying nutrients. Know how to draw the spinal cord, so important. And know that white matter is axons only, grey matter is cell bodies and dendrites. Know what a ganglion is and know that reflex actions are there for our protection and know in very good detail detail the reflex arc and be able to draw and label this perfectly. There you go. Best of luck. This video is not made for monetary gain and it's not intended for commercial use and all the icons I used are from the Noun Project. I'm a pro member.